Yeah. Whoo! I'll speak to my fear and I'll preach to my doubt. I, I love that line right there. That is just so good because that's what you have to do, you know. I guarantee you there's going to be plenty of fear produced in this world. The enemy's going to make sure of that and plenty of doubt that goes with it. So you're going to have to stand on God's word is what it really boils down to. And that's just a really a perfect, great song for what we're going to look at today. I, uh, I kind of enter today with a little bit of uh, intrepidation, I guess would be a, the right word. Because I'm not, you know, it's, it's funny how at times, and maybe this is a little bit too much inside baseball about, about pastors and preaching, but, uh, you know, as the Lord begins to speak to you during the week about what it is that you that you that you're going to share, and by that you know it's uh, you see you reading the word and and a passage jumps out and so, it says something in there that begins to move you in one way or another or or something happens and the Lord just communicates in lots of ways but but that's kind of how it moves and then as you build things uh, you uh, you're you know you, you you're hoping that what you're going to say and what you're dealing with is going to matter in somebody's life. I can't think of anything more tormenting than to try to get up and speak to a group of people where what you're saying doesn't make any, any difference at all in anybody's life, which uh, I've heard plenty of sermons. I probably preach plenty of sermons like that, not on purpose, but they probably have come across that way. But today, I say that I'm, I'm telling you all this because uh, the subject that we're in today is really a pretty deep subject. Um, and by deep, I'm, I don't mean that you can't understand or that, you know, that it's just off the chart or something. I'm just saying that it's not, it's not talked about very much. And, it, and it's not something that you hear all the time. And, and therefore, um, I think we suffer because of this, because this is a truth. This is a principle in God's word that if we understand it, it's going to strengthen our life. It's going to, it's going to help our life in the fight that we have with the enemy. Um, it's going to help us understand some things and to, and to know how to prepare and what it is that's coming in that's affecting our lives. We're talking about three steps to victory. And last week, I started by telling you, all Right, the first step to victory would be stop believing lies. And of course, you know, the enemy lies to us about what God thinks about us, who God is, what God wants. He lies to you about who you are. He tries to put you down. He tries to uh, belittle you and undermine you and all of these kind of things constantly. He uses other people to do it. He even uses, you, you, you'll even do it to yourself, you know. And, and so the first step in, in moving toward victory in this spiritual life is, hey, we got to stop believing what, our, what the enemy is telling us about our God and about ourselves. The second step today is a, kind of a natural response to that, and I call it just keep believing the truth. So we stop believing lies, and then the second step is we got to keep believing the truth. Well, that sounds uh, a little bit simpler than it really is because the truth is God's word. So what this message is really a message to, that encourages is for you to stay in the Word of God. And if, you, if, you're not, if you're not in it, to get in it and to stay in it because it's the only truth that we have. I was, Tanya and I were talking last night and I said, you know, if it wasn't for the Word of God, I don't know, I, I don't know how I would be, uh, be able to stand where we are right now. I mean, it, I can't watch news. I can't listen to stuff. It just makes me so infuriated, angry, hostile. And it, it, and it would be super frightening, except for the fact that God tells us in his word all about this. Now, if that's not true, if the word isn't true, then we're all in a big mess. I mean, it, we're, we're, we're all, all is gone if the word of God is not true. But I believe that it is. And I, I don't want to get. I don't want to start preaching on why I believe that. But uh, it, 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 there are lots of reasons. But but one of the things that I mean, just take the prophecies concerning Jesus alone that were done thousands and thousands of years ago, and they happened just exactly like they were prophesied. Only God could do things like that. Only God could fulfill those things. And everything about the Word just testifies the truth of the Word. So uh, uh, we have the Word of God. 
as a, as a tool to fight against the enemy. And, and we need it too because um, the Bible tells us that it is necessary for us once we receive Christ to grow and to mature as a Christian. In other words, to get stronger, to be better uh, equipped, to uh, obey better, to, uh, the, for the mind of Christ to become more developed in, in us. But the biggest roadblock to that is, that is that growing in Christ is, 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 we are not naturally inclined to grow in Christ. We're, we're naturally inclined to keep on living the same way we were living before we came to Christ. And we have the tendency to do that, and because of that, we stay immature. Now, what are the tendencies? Why do we have tendencies like this? Why is this a difficult thing for us to do? Well, let me, let me give you a, a profound statement here, all right? And here's a profound statement. Uh, we as human beings are triune beings. We are a trichotomy. That's an impressive word, isn't it? That's a big word. It just means that we're made up of three parts. God is made up of three parts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're created in the image of God. We are three-part beings. Say this with me. I am a spirit. I have a soul, and I live in a body. I am a spirit. That's the real me. That's the part that's never going to die. There's part of me that will never die that God placed in me, and that is my spirit. I am a spirit. That's who I am. And I have a soul, which is the, the, the mind, the will, and the emotions. It's the seat of intellect. It's, you're listening to me right now with your soul. You make decisions with your soul. You have emotions with your soul. It is your mind, your will, and your emotions. I have a soul. I am a spirit. I have a soul, and I live in a body. So this, this body that you see is just simply an earthly home for my spirit to live in. And so as, as we are triune beings, the, we, we, have, we, we have a problem. And our problem is that according to Genesis chapter 2, uh, when man fell, God said that if you, if you eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, uh, you shall surely die. And when Adam and Eve ate of the tree in the midst of the garden, uh, something in them immediately surely died. Well, we know it wasn't their body because their bodies continued to live on for about 900 more years, as a matter of fact. And, and so we know that God, now death set into their bodies and they began the process of dying which would not have happened had they not eaten of the tree in the midst of the garden. But it took 900 years or so before their bodies finally died. So I don't think God was talking about their bodies because the, the evidence says different from that. Now, I don't think God was talking about their soul either because they were still making soulish decisions after they took of the fruit. Look at Genesis 3. Tan, can you pop that up there, 8 through 10? Yeah, put that on. Yeah, we're going to go on past that. We're going to go past that. There it is. There it is. All right, look at this. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, this is a choice that they made. This is a choice of their will, this is what they thought would be the best thing to do. Seeing that they disobeyed God, they made a choice to, to hide themselves in the midst of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. There's emotion. Your emotion comes from your will. And because I was naked, which is self-awareness, which comes out of your will, and I hid myself, 
which was self-preservation. So Adam's soul was still very much alive after he ate of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. And God said, when you do it now, you're gonna surely die. Well, what was it that died? What was dead? If the soul wasn't dead and the body wasn't dead, what was it that died? It was his spirit. That's exactly right. The spirit of man died in the Garden of Eden. And every one of us, when we're born, we are born with a dead spirit. Now, I don't, I, I, I don't want that to sound heretical uh, or anything. It's not, I'm not a heretic. I just, I want you to see what God's word says about us and why it's so difficult for us to uh, consistently grow and mature in the Lord. All right, when, when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, their soul stayed alive, their body stayed alive, oxygen was going in and out of their lungs, they were breathing and they were living. But according to Ephesians chapter two, the apostle Paul says this in verse two, and you, he made alive, Jesus made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." I think that's probably, that's a pretty good description of a dead spirit and a soul that is alive. So before we come to Christ, we are not alive spiritually. Our spirit is not alive. Only our soul, only our mind, our will and our emotions lead us in every decision that we make and everything we do. We do only what we can understand. We do only what we think we ought to do. And we do only what we feel is in our best interest. No decisions are made based on anything to do with sacrifice, with grace, with mercy, with kindness. It's all self-centered. As a matter of fact, the word soul means selfish, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I want you to see a very familiar passage of scripture that shows you what I'm talking about. One of the, one of the aspects of it is John 10.10. 10. John 10.10 10 is quoted all the time. It, it misquoted really, but I mean, I don't want to pick about it now. But the, it says, the thief comes, but to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, everybody says that's the devil, and I don't want to make a big deal, but it's not talking about the devil. It's talking about fake preachers is what it's talking about. Read the context. It's talking about fake preachers that lead people astray and try to con them out of money and take advantage of them. That's the thief. That thief, it comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And Jesus says, but I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, when we quote that passage, we tend to favor the last half of that passage which says God came, Jesus came to give us life more abundantly. And we have a tendency to just kind of stick on the abundant life, which abundant life's a wonderful thing and we all want abundant life. I'm not trying to campaign against abundant light, uh, life. But, I, but the phrase that we most often overlook is the first thing that Jesus said when he said, look, you know why I've come? I have come that you might have life. So in other words, Jesus is saying, all right, I'm gonna give you abundant life, but the first thing I had to give you is actually life because you were dead. You had no spiritual relationship. Your spirit was not alive. And so the first thing I have to do, the abundant life's a wonderful thing, but you can't have the abundant life if you're not alive. And so Jesus said, no matter how much you think you're living without me, you're not living at all. And so he came to give us life. And the problem became, if I'm living with a dead spirit and a living soul, my soul is doing something that it was never designed to do. 
God never intended for, uh, for our soul to be alive and our spirit to be dead. He intended for our spirit to always control our life. Because if our soul controls our life, then we're gonna relate to God and everything else by what we think, by what we want, and by what we feel is best. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to, to relate. Your mind is what you think, your will is what you want, and your emotions are what you feel about things. So this is why Christians have many of the problems that we do, because we find ourselves making decisions on what we think, what we want, and what we feel. And so the weapon or the tool that God gives us to change that is his word. His word matures us. His word challenges us. His word speaks to us so that we will no longer be controlled by what we think what we want and what we feel, but we'll be controlled by what God thinks, what God says, and what God feels. And the, it's the word that leads us there. So I wanna to talk to you about our soul. And this is, you hardly ever hear anything about it. It's mentioned every now and then, but you hardly hear ever, anything about it. And I wanna give you three, three conclusions concerning our soul. Number one, the soul is selfish. See, what has to happen now is something has to change this soul or else we're gonna always be inclined to do what we think, to do what we want, and to do what we feel. If that doesn't change, then we're, we're, we're gonna follow the same pattern of life for, for, for our whole time, and we're never gonna mature, we're never gonna grow, we're never gonna have abundant life. Uh, it's going to be a battle and a struggle for the rest of our life, all right? So this soul has to be challenged. So let's just get in, let's see, see about the soul. The soul is selfish, all right. Uh, if you make a soulish decision, you make a selfish decision. Um, as a matter of fact, the word soul, I mentioned it, uh, and, and it was in a verse earlier, it's the word nefesh, which that's not important for you to remember, but that word simply means self. So the word that's, that's used in the Bible for soul is the same word as self. So we came into the world with a dead spirit, so for years, uh, the only way we can relate to God is with our minds. And our minds are a wonderful thing now, and they're wonderful gifts from the Lord. And the more you look at the mind and the more you study the mind that God has given us, the more impressed you are at what God has done and in giving us the mind that we have. Now, our mind is a wonderful tool and it's a great, uh, a great gift from God. Uh, with your mind, you can remember, when you, when you walk into a place, with your, your mind sees everything, it remembers everything, it it records everything and it categorizes everything. And I know some of you sitting there going, well, uh, where is it, you know? <laughs> Cause I, I have trouble getting it, you know? Well, it, 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 it's not always in your conscious mind. It's, it's, it goes into your subconscious mind. Now, all right, don't glaze over. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, all right? All right, so when you run into a situation of any kind, your mind is going to remember everything that it has experienced that is similar to the situation that you are in. As an example, you've walked into a room before, haven't you? And you've said, wait, it seems seem like I've been here before. That deja vu is what we call it. Or you smell something that, that triggers one of those, mm, I've, I've, or hear some words and you say, man, I, I've heard that before. That's, that, that's your mind. It remembers everything that you've seen, everything that you've heard, everything you've smelled, uh, all, every, everything in life it's remembering. And, it, and so when you come into a situation, what happens is your mind has the tendency to react in similar situations with the, in the same way that it reacted before. As an example, you walk into this room, the first thing your mind says when you walk into this room is, have I ever been in a place like this before? Oh yes, I have been in about 300 places that are a lot like this. And I have been in 35 places that are very similar to this. 
And I have been in five places that are just like this. And it just records, and it, and, and, and it does that without us really even being aware of it. Like, I, I know you've experienced this. You've experienced it. Like, have you ever met a person you just didn't like them the, when, you, when you met them? I mean, nothing happened. You didn't have a bad encounter. But for some reason, you know, you just, you just you, as soon as you saw them, you said, man, I don't, I don't like that guy. Somebody introduces their husband to you. Susie brings her husband, Bill. And you, you meet in a restaurant, let's just say, and you shake hands. Susie says, this is my husband, Bill. And you shake hands with Bill, say, hey, Bill, how are you? He says, oh, doing wonderful, and how are you? And you just have a pleasant conversation and very polite, mannered and everything. You walk out of the restaurant when you're on your way, you get in your automobile, you look at your wife and you say, I don't like that guy. And she says, what? Well, why don't you like him? And you may not even be able to come up with a reason why you don't like him. But let me tell you why you don't like him. You don't like him because your brain has told you some information about people like him. As soon as you met him, your brain said, have you ever met, anyth- have you ever met anybody like this before? Your brain said, yeah, you've met about 200 people that are pretty much like this guy. And then you've met about uh, 25 people that are very much like this guy. And you have met three people that are just like this guy. And one of them pull your gym shorts down in the seventh grade gym class. So you know all about him and you don't like him. And, And your wife says, well, why don't you like him? You don't even know him. And you go, oh yes, I got a whole file on him right up here. I know, I know just what that guy's about. Well, what I'm describing to you is what the Bible calls a stronghold. That within our minds, that we have also a liability. It's not only an asset, it's a liability. Because our mind has the tendency to keep informing us and encouraging us to act the same way this time that we did when we encountered it before. It, it, it builds a pattern and it, and it draws you to, to have the same conclusions and, and the same feelings and the same actions as you did before. And that's how strongholds are formed. Strongholds are nothing more really than your soul deciding how you're going to respond to a situation. And you can have all kinds of strongholds in your life. You can have, I mean, lust, pride, greed, uh, inferiority, insecurity, uh, drug addiction. I mean, you can have all kinds of strongholds in your life. And whenever the pressure gets on you and you encounter that situation, you are going to be encouraged to act the same way you acted before. Like when you get some anxiety and some stress in a situation, um, your brain says, man, we need it. Man, I need a drink. <laughs> you know why it says that? Because every time you had that situation in the past, a, a good drink helped you lighten up and made you feel more comfortable. Oh, I need a cigarette. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 you're just encouraged by your soul to make decisions that are very self-centered and self-focused and to make those decisions over and over and over. So in believing the truth, we have to understand that, that our soul needs to receive truth in order to change because it's going to respond in a similar way every time unless something affects it that will cause it to change, to grow up, to mature. All right, here's the second um, uh, conclusion about the soul. The soul must submit to the spirit. Now, I want to share a truth with you in some verses. There are 10 verses, so we're just going to run through them. I just want you to see uh, what the Bible says, the relationship between what happens in the Bible and our life, that there is a connection there that God wants us to see. So we're going to 1 Corinthians 10 and beginning at verse 1, look at what it says. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. 
all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Well, that would be a major idol today, right? That's all we do is play, you know, sit down, eat, drink, and play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. I got a message called the stake on a stick, and I need to preach that. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now here's, I read all that to read this one verse to you. Verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. What does admonition mean? Our instruction. So all of the things that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness, God said they were an example for us. And he wrote them down. Now, now think of all of the events and all of the issues and all of the things that could have been written about the children of Israel in 40 years wandering around in the desert. And yet the things that God chose to inspire were written and placed in his word so that we could see them and they would become examples to us and it would teach us some things that we are to do and not do. So that's the purpose for why God wrote all of those things. Now, I just I told you that because I want to show you one of those things. And this comes out of the book of Romans, chapter 9. But it's a quote of God talking to Rebekah, who is Esau and Jacob's mother. When she had Esau and Jacob in the womb... There were twins, you remember, but Esau was born first, so Esau was the oldest one, and Jacob was the youngest one. So God is talking to Rebekah while Esau and Jacob are still in her womb, and, and, and Paul's just recounting this in Romans 9, he, but, but it comes out of Genesis 25 if you want to go back and read that whole story. Look at verse 12. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Now, that's love and hate in, in the realm of uh, respect and, and uh, in comparison. It's not like God just hated Esau and he loved Jacob. He loved both of them, but he respected Jacob and, and he disrespected Esau. Really is a better word for that. But the point, that's not the point. The point I want you to see is what he says, the younger Shall, or the older shall serve the younger. Now, believe it or not, this is a principle of God that the younger, that the older will serve the younger. And I've I, I, I got about seven places, I think, uh, where this is seen. I mean, Aaron was three years older than Moses, but Aaron served Moses. God chose to use Joseph, the 11th of 12 brothers, God chose David to be king rather than one of his seven older brothers. God chose to make Jacob the father of the 12 tribes of Israel over his older brother Esau. Hit me, Tan. God chose Gideon, who was the youngest in his family, to deliver Israel from the Midianites. Solomon was chosen by God to be king instead of his older brothers. Jacob chose to bless Joseph's younger son Ephraim, saying that God would make him a multitude of nations and, uh, and, and he would be greater than his older brother Manasseh. Anyway, there may be others in the scripture. That's just some I just put together quickly. But what you see there is a principle of God that the older shall serve the younger. Now, this is not a natural principle. This is a spiritual principle. 
In other words, I'm not telling you if you're the youngest one in your family to go home and look at your older sibling and say, hey, the Bible says you got to serve me. No, this doesn't have anything to do with natural stuff like your family. This is a spiritual principle. And what God was trying to do is to help us to, to understand or to see the principle by using all these younger ones and the older ones actually serving under the younger ones. He was trying to teach us to look for that kind of thing in life. And, and, and it could be applied in many ways, but I'm going to apply it in one way. And here's the one way. And that is that our soul, which is older, is designed to serve our spirit, who is younger. Now, follow me for just a second. When you were conceived, and I do believe that life starts at conception. When you were conceived in your mother's womb, you were a baby human being. From the moment Though the, the egg and the sperm it united, you were not a goo, you were not a blob, you were not a, a mass of tissue, you were a baby human being. And when that happened, your soul was immediately brought to life. The moment of conception, your soul comes alive. Your spirit is dead, because of sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. So none of our spirits come alive. It's only our soul that comes alive and our body, obviously. So for all of the years that we live without Christ, our soul is making all the decisions in our life. Our soul is deciding where we go, what we say, how we live, what we think about things, how we feel about things, what we ought to do, what kind of decisions we need to make in life. It's all being made by our soul. That, remember, was never designed to be in charge. God designed our spirit to be in charge. That's why he told Adam and Eve, don't eat of that tree right there in the midst of the garden. He never intended for the spirit to be dead and the soul to be in charge, but that's what happened. And now when Christ, when you receive Christ, then Christ makes your spirit come to life. You remember Ephesians 2, we read just a moment, and, and you, he has quickened, what means he has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's what Jesus does. So now, all right, follow me. So, what that means is that your soul has been around a lot longer than your spirit. In control, large and in charge. And it has been making all the decisions. And so here's what happened. When I was 16 years old, I came to Christ. So for 16 years, my soul made all the decisions for me. What I thought, how, what I should do, how I acted, where I should go, my emotions, my, my determinations, uh, what I could remember and think, my soul made all those decisions. When I came to an altar at Carmel Baptist Church in Meridian, Mississippi, as a 16-year-old young man, and I bowed my knee and I said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I know that my sin separates me and you and I don't want to be separated from you. I want to be close to you. So will you come into my life and be my Lord? I surrender. I wave the white flag. I don't want to be boss anymore. I want you to be boss. When I did that, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, came into my life and brought my spirit alive. So now... I have a spirit that is in charge. And the first thing my spirit said to my soul was, I'm in charge now. And my soul, being the gentle, polite, nice person that he is, looked at my spirit and said, uh, sure, sure. Now, do you think that's what happened? No, I tell you what happened. When the spirit 
said, I'm in charge, my soul said, over my dead body. Boy, we, it, not without a fight. And guess what? It's been fighting ever since. James, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 21, I'm going to, I put this up here in the, in the old King James Version because I like the way it says it. I'll explain it to you. Wherefore, this is, this is James saying, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Don't you love that? Superfluity of naughtiness means an abundance of wickedness. So he's saying, your filthy, wicked self, lay aside your filthy, wicked self, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, when he's talking about saving our souls, he's not talking about saved as being lost, going to heaven, like salvation saved. It means to change our souls, to convert our souls, to grow our souls and, and make them better and bigger. So what is James saying about our soul? That when the Spirit comes alive in us, the Spirit is in charge, and God begins to speak his word into our lives. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. Jesus said before he left this earth, right before he left, as a matter of fact, the night before he was crucified, he told his disciples, I have many things to tell you. I have many things I want to tell you, but you can't receive them. You're not mature enough. You're not grown enough. You don't, you, you have, you, you, you just, it wouldn't benefit you right now. So I'm not going to waste my time telling you. But when the spirit of truth is come, he will reveal all things to you. For he is the spirit of truth, and he is all truth. So what happens is when, when my spirit comes alive, the Holy Spirit starts speaking truth to my once unconverted soul so that he can grow my soul up and mature my soul so that my soul stops fighting against the Spirit and cooperates with the Spirit so that we can move forward and advance and have an abundant life. But notice what James says. James says that it's not just any word that changes our life. It's not just the word that we hear. It's not just the word that we see. It's the word that engrafts itself in us, that changes us. You know what the graph means, right? If you graph something like a bone graph, or like you graft a plant, you know, a limb of a plant into another, you make a little split, put that limb in, you know, wrap him up, and this limb now starts growing out of this, of this tree. Uh, all right, that's to engraft. And so what, what God is saying is that there is a word that he's going to speak to us that is truth, that grows us up, and it is that word that sticks in us is the word that changes our life. It's not a casual comment. It's not a, you know, uh, I saw that yesterday. It, it, it's a word that sticks. It's a truth that sticks inside. And where does this truth come from? From, from his word. I mean, the, the encouragement is, all right, stay in the word. You know, believe the truth because that's what's going to change your life. Now, does my soul need to change? It sure does. Because, you know, when, when, when something happens, let's just say something happens between Tanya and I. We get out of snuff with each other, out of fellowship. All right, my spirit says, uh, you need to love her enough that you're willing to die for her. My spirit says, you need to forgive that and get over it and let it go. It's not that big a deal. My soul says... You need to, to straighten her out, give her a piece of your mind, and show her who's boss around here. So my soul needs to be matured. My soul needs to understand what's going on. And, 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 and just to think about it this way, just let me ask you this way. All right, 
the things that you're reading now, the things that you are watching now, the things that you are listening to now, are they feeding your soul or are they feeding your spirit? Because the one you feed the most is the one that's in charge. I tell you what I find, I find most of us have a really big fat soul and a little skinny malnourished spirit. It's like a great Dane fighting a chihuahua. I mean, you know, it's just it's ridiculous. And it's amazing how much we read. You know, one thing I've noticed, and of course I drive a bus, and so, you know, I'm around kids all the time, uh, and, and teenagers, uh, high school guys and, and little ones. And the, one of the most common phrases that you hear about school is, I, I, I hate to read. I hate to read. And, and, and you know who's saying that? Somebody who's got a, a smartphone in their hand and they're constantly in it, reading everything on that. I mean, just, I mean, no, you don't hate to read. You read every, man, you read 24 hours a day, seven days a week on all of these websites and all these things you're interested in. And, run, and you, you just hate to read what, what you don't want to read. That, that's what you really do. You read everything. So, but it's amazing to me how much we read about everything and how little we, we read the Word of God. Uh, the Bible that's going to affect our lives and change our lives and convert our soul and make a difference in us so our soul starts responding in a different way. So it learns a different way to respond. All right, so the soul is selfish and the soul has to submit to the Spirit. One other little thing here, and this is really good news and you'll like it, the soul must die. All right, I know you came all the way out to church this morning for some good news. The good news, God's going to kill you. All right, yeah, all right, amen, everybody, let's go on. Yeah, the soul must die. And by that, I mean this. We have to die to our old thoughts. We have to die to our old decisions. And we have to die to our old feelings. What is the most common phrase in the Christian vocabulary for the difference we have to have in our life in order to be a Christian. It would be, I must die to myself. So myself is my soul. <laughs> and myself is what I have to die to so that it's not what I think, it's not what I feel, and it's not what I want, but it is what God says, what God feels, and what God wants in my life. King David did a lot of talking to his soul. I don't know if y'all have ever noticed this. But he talks a lot to his soul. I mean, he tells his soul all kind of things, like um, do, don't be discouraged, he says to his soul. Or uh, uh, he tells his soul to bless God, or he tells his soul to be quiet, to re, tells his soul to rejoice. He talks to his soul a lot. Now, let me read one of the things he says to his soul. This, so this is Psalm 131, and it's verse 2. Look at what he says. Surely I have calmed and quieted my spirit. Now this is what I want you to see. Like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. What is David saying? David is saying, I looked at my soul and I said to my soul, you need to calm down and you need to be quiet. But I found out that when I said that to my soul, that my soul was like a weaned child. So how do you wean a child? You take away his milk and you give him solid food. Is this a happy experience? Let me read you a couple of things that Paul said in Corinthians. This is real quick. Corinthians and Hebrews. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able. Then in Hebrews he says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is 
is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What is that? What are they saying? They're saying, my soul must grow up. I have to get my soul off of milk and get it on some solid food so it can grow up. This is why it is important where you go to church. This is why it's important that the person who is preaching the message or teaching the class is actually teaching it from the word of God, not from some good opinion or something. Because, look, good opinions don't change anything in you. Good news changes stuff in you. And it is important whether you're fed or not. So when you wean a child, what does a child do? He throws a fit, right? Starts crying. I mean, he's just throwing a fit. All right. What would happen, do you suppose, to your soul when your soul gets weaned off of milk? Well, he's going to cry and throw a fit, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and you, know why they, you know why a child cries and throws a fit whenever you're weaning him? Because he thinks that you're trying to kill him. Because, I mean, think about what you've done. What have you done? You have taken the only source of food that he has ever experienced in his life. I mean, he doesn't remember the womb where he's fed through a, through a tube. Uh, he just remembers what he's done all of his life so far. You've plopped the bottle in. You've given the milk and so forth, and that's his life. Now, all of a sudden, you're taking away his source of life, the only source he knows. So he thinks you're trying to kill him, and so he begins to rebel and throw a fit and so forth because he doesn't have any idea that there's another source of food than what he's been fed. Now, I don't want this to sound harsh, but it is going to sound a little bit harsh. When your soul believes that God is trying to kill it, uh, your soul is right. That's what God is trying to do to your soul. Your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions. Let me read you a passage, and, I'm, and, then, and, and we'll quit. This is out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, and you know this verse very well, and you quote it all the time, and nobody ever quotes verse 13. They quote verse 12, but they never quote verse 13. Here it is. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. What's that saying? The word of God is like a sword that is so powerful, so sharp, that it can actually divide between what you think, what you want, and what you feel, and what God thinks, what God wants, and what God feels in life. So the word of God, get the picture of the sword now because this is important for, for, for what I'm going to share in just a second. It, the word of God is called a sword that cuts. All right, so it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the, and here comes the soul now, and is a discerner of the thoughts that's your mind, and intense, that's your will, and of, of the heart, and the heart is the seat of your emotions. I love you with all my heart, we say. Or I believe that, I, I, in my, I believe that in my heart. It's the seat of our emotions. All right, so you get the drift here. It's the word of God that deals with all of these mind, will, all, all right. Now here's a verse nobody ever says anything about. Notice verse 13, and, all right, conjunction, continuing the same thought, right? And, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word open, there, you know, the Greek language, and I know that 
none of us in here are scholars. I know enough to read a concordance and, and make some sense out of things. But if you notice sometimes, the, a lot of Greek words sound like their English counterparts. And the reason for this is because Greek was translated to Latin, and then Latin was translated to English. So a lot of the words cross over, like the word cardia. And the Greek word cardia is where we get our English word cardio, which means heart, right? Logos in the Greek means logic. It means the logic, the way you think. Graphe in Greek means graft. Uh, Suke means your soul. We have a study, psychology, that is a study of your soul. So I say that because I want you to know that the word open here, where it says everything is naked and open to the one with which we have to give an account. That word open is the word trachelizo. So trache, what would we think trache might be? Our trachea, right? Our windpipe. Some people call it the gullet. So trache means that it has something to do with my windpipe. And lizo is a military word that means to take your enemy and prepare him to be killed. So trachy lizo, the word that is used for open right there, that the sword of, the, of God, the, the word of God is quicker than any two-edged sword and, it, and we're gonna be open to him we must give an account to, with trachy lizo. All right, I'm gonna read you the exact definition out of Strong's Concordance, all right? Here it is, trachelizo, to bend back the neck to expose the gullet of a victim for killing. Sounds like God has big plans for our soul, doesn't it? <laughs> my Lord. The word of God is going to cut my soul's throat. And, uh, and it has nowhere to hide because it's going to be naked and open before God. So, your unredeemed thoughts, your unredeemed desires, your unredeemed feelings, God loves to kill those things in our life and replace them with what he thinks and what he wants and what he feels about you. God would love for you to, to, to know how he feels about you rather than knowing what the devil tells you God feels about you. God wants you to know what he thinks about you and not just what the enemy tells you that he thinks about you. So God is going to have to kill our soul. And here, uh, listen, he's not trying to kill you, okay? He, he's trying to kill the thing that's killing you or to kill the thing that's killing his presence in you. And that's your soul. And we all have the tendency to, to stay with our soul because we've just been well trained so long and we followed it so long. Some of you got saved when you were 50 years old. Your soul been in charge 50 years, man. I mean, that's a, hard, that's a hard road to get over. And some 20 years and 30 years and 60 years. I mean, my goodness, man. That's the soul that God has to trachelizo so that your spirit can come alive and be large and in charge. Uh, so you came to church today to hear a, a, a good word. Um, and, and the good word is God's trying to kill you. So, all right, that's good. Um, but it's all over the scripture. Uh, the apostle Paul told the Galatians, uh, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not me, but Christ who lives through me. I have been crucified with Christ. Jesus went to a cross. This is why Jesus came, for the cross. So Jesus had a cross, right? We all agree, Jesus had a cross. Jesus went to his cross, and because he did, we get to come to him because he bore his cross.
But let me, let me read you what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We have a cross. Jesus has a, had a cross and we, and we have a cross. And if we're gonna belong to him, we have to take up our cross just like he took up his cross. And hey, he made it worse in Luke 9. I put it up there. Uh, then he said to all of them, same exact words, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and he adds, daily. And follow me. So this is not a one-time event in life. This is an everyday thing. Every day I stay in the word. I read the word. I let the word read me. You know, that, that's, that's the important issue about it. Uh, jumping in there, I, I know, how many of you, and don't raise your hand because I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but how many of you have ever assigned yourself a Bible reading uh, agenda that I'm gonna read the Bible through in a year, and if I do, I'm gonna have to read this many chapters today and this many tomorrow, and then Proverbs and Psalms, I'm gonna have to read this many of it. And, and you got a strategy and you got a plan. Invariably, along the way somewhere, many times probably, there's gonna be conflict. And you're gonna run in there and say, man, I, I don't get time for that today. Oh, well, let me just read, let me just read one, one chapter. All right. Uh, uh, all right, all right, all right. Well, I got in at least my one chapter. And then you've gone away from there. And has God ever kind of just spoken to you in your heart? You know, like, uh, do, do you remember what you read today? <laughs> <laughs> what was it about? Uh, God. <laughs> Is that all? Uh, and Jesus. God and Jesus. What it was about. I remember all that. It's about that. No, you, you don't remember what it's about because you didn't read it. You didn't get your time. Look, it's not about how many words you read. It's about how those words read you. When you read the Bible, it reads you. And God speaks to you. And that's what stay in the word means. Keep on believing the truth. Stop believing lies, keep believing the truth. All right, bow your head with me one moment, would you please? So our question is, so what is the Holy Spirit saying to me through this message I just heard? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to take away from here? Is this going to change my life? Am I going to do this? Is this important to do? What is he saying to you? Yeah, yeah. I know what your soul is saying. <laughs> yeah, we know him, don't we? But what is the Holy Spirit saying to you?